Well, good evening, everyone. Um, you know, with the details of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor killed in encounters with uh, authorities and Ahmaud Aubrey, whose accusers were, um, or, or those who were accused of killing him were a retired police officer and his son. Um, it's no surprise to see the size and the intensity of the uh, protests around the country and in our own city as well in front of uh, uh, police headquarters buildings. And uh, in response, I wanted to do what our church does with um, events like this. We've typically formed um, panel discussions in the past for things such as immigration or the question of gay marriage or uh, the Me Too movement. We've, we've pulled people onto a stage and we've had a panel discussion about those things. And uh, because of the pandemic we're in, it's uh, not quite as easy to pull people on a stage and, and have a live panel discussion, but uh, there is a certain advantage for us to be able to have this panel discussion in this way because it enables us to uh, have somebody all the way from Mansfield, Texas be a part of these things. And I'll introduce each of the persons who are uh, serving as our panelists here. So first of all, there's Tim Shamba, and he's 25 and has spent pretty much his whole life at Hillcrest. Uh, he was baptized as a believer at our church in 2008. He got his degree in industrial distribution from Texas A&M a few years ago, and uh, he is currently between jobs looking for opportunities in software sales. And so if anybody knows anything, Tim will be very glad for you to send anything along his way. Uh, Beth Hunt is with us as well. She's a native Austinite and a UT Austin graduate working in technology. She's been a member of our church for a couple of years now, and she is the mother of of four sons ranging in age from 22 to four. And then there's Nicole Caston, her daughter, Kira Stewart. Uh, they've been members of our church, uh, Nicole, I think uh, 11 years now. It's hard to believe she, uh, Kira was in third grade when you guys came here and she's a 19 year old now. So, wow. And then uh, there's Reverend Dr. Michael Evans Sr. Uh, on uh, the panel with us tonight as well. He has served as pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Mansfield, Texas for more than 28 years. He's married to Lisa, they have two adult children, and among his many roles in addition to pastoring, he has served as a reserve chaplain in the United States Navy as a commissioned officer. He served as an adjunct professor at Dallas Baptist University's College of Christian Faith, and for two years now, Dr. Evans has served as the president of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Pastor Evans is the author of a book called uh, Leadership in the Black Church. So all of y'all, uh, welcome. Glad to have you guys here. I should also mention that uh, Mike McDonough is uh, on, uh, on the screen as well. And Mike uh, serves as our Minister of Education and Administration. And uh, he and his family have been with us for uh, coming up on a year now. And uh, we're glad to have Mike here, not only to serve kind of as the host of this event, but he might uh, weigh in on a couple of these questions as well, because he and Amanda are the parents of an African-American son, and it's just a really remarkable story that you guys, if you haven't heard it before, maybe you'll be able to hear it sometime in the future uh, about how Ben uh, came into their family as their son. But here's a question I want to start off with you all as panelists. What do those in our church who are not black need to know about the challenges unique to being an African-American in today's culture? All right, Tom, I, I'll speak to that. Uh, you know, uh, there, there is that, that difference there. Uh, those babies, bless their heart. Um, you know, there's always somebody outside of our secured circle who uh, at times feels as if it's their mission in life <laughs> to, to kind of remind you that, that you, you know, or will say to you that, that you're different. And, uh, of course, there's just certain... Uh, innate biases that uh, tend to be a part of our society that parents work hard to uh, shield their children from, of course, until they get to a given age to where they're out of our sight for a while and, and they'll come home with, it, with their hearts broken. But, but again, it's a part of, of our responsibility just to walk them through, talk them through uh, certain uh, idiosyncrasies and issues that other people have, uh, not them. That, that's just my, my word in that regard. Thanks, Michael. I will go ahead and piggyback off of that. I think um, one thing is 
society continuously reminds you that you are black and you it's something that you never really get to stop doing whether that's within the workplace whether that's within school whether you're shopping at the grocery store whether you're just out and about you know walking your dog at the park uh, society has the way our society is kind of structured and built it has a way of reminding you that you are an african-american and it's something that you can feel as you kind of go about your life. And so, and want to add something else to that as well. Um, I think uh, the powers that be, uh, they have a way of depicting the way that African Americans tend to respond to oppression. And the way they do that is they oftentimes like to make it feel like to make it seem that, you know, people are kind of acting, uh, you know, out of line or people like people's response to the way they've been treated is like completely out of line and isn't really reciprocal to how they've been treated. And I think we really need to reshape that and kind of look at, kind of look at the situation. Like, you know, this is the, this is the, these people's response to how they've been treated. These people aren't, you know, out of line. They're not, you know, acting just to show out. This is how they've been treated. And this response is a perfect reflection of that. So. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Beth and Nicole, any thoughts? Um, I may have a unique perspective, I like to say, because I've grown up generally with predominant white neighborhoods, white schools. Um, middle school, high school is more integrated. Um, my daughter goes to Anderson, which is predominantly white school. So like Tim said, you're constantly reminded, even if it's not intentional, that mm -hmm. you are different. Yeah. Um, I like to treat everyone the same. You need to give me a reason to not like you or to not trust you, whatever the case may be. But it's not just because you look different. But unfortunately, the way our country's history is, which, you know, we can't change what's happened in the past. We can just move forward. But because of the past, um, there are people that still think a particular way, even though I've never given them a reason to think, you know, any way about me. And you are reminded, like every day I wake up, I look in the mirror, I know that I'm a black woman in Austin, Texas, which is, I'm still a minority. Um, it hasn't really held me back. Um, I must say, I've been given a lot of opportunities that maybe others, black people, or maybe a black man instead of a black woman may not have received. Um, so I haven't really been personally I don't want to use not affected. It, it, there's been be bits and pieces in the past that I've, you know, had my experience with racism, but it hasn't really been like a day-to-day -day situation. I've never been pulled over by the police. But again, black women, I think, have a different experience than black men. So it's, sure. it's kind of a, a different, it's like we're still black, but there's still a difference because I'm a woman versus being a man. So, mm -hmm. but I'm no. still, like Tim said, very aware in my surroundings when I go somewhere there's not going to be a whole lot of people that look like me and it's just it is what it is you don't focus on it but you are aware when you're in certain situations that you may need to talk different you may need to you know carry yourself differently than you would if you were with a different type of um, environment so you just you have to just be flexible and just remember your surroundings remember your audience but yeah, it is something that I'm very aware. Of. And when things like what's going on now happen, it's just more brought to the forefront. Oh yeah, um, I may have forgotten today that I'm actually black because I actually like it that way. I don't want to walk around like, oh, I'm a black woman, but I am. But I don't, that's not my main focus. But days like this and weeks like this and situations that keep happening over and over again. Yeah, I'm black in America. <laughs> I appreciate it, Nicole. It's Beth, this sounds pretty similar to what to you and I were talking about yesterday on the phone, mm -hmm. that you feel that there may be a somewhat different experience as a black woman than, uh, than, than a, a black man might experience in this culture. Yeah, agreed. Um, I remember taking a class back in college and they talked about some stereotypes among uh, the black community um, and where they originated. And one of the like main differences in, in terms of I guess how black women are perceived and our experience is how they differ from that of black men. It goes back honestly to like the times of slavery. You had the 
the mamie in the house. And she was in a position of authority. She took care of, you know, the the owner's children, and she basically ran the house, you know. And there was it was a position of respect. Whereas the black man, based upon his skin type, he might be in, he might be out. And I think that those those stereotypes and the experiences that go along with those, I mean, they're still being perpetuated today. So as Nicole said, you know, our experiences are completely different from that of the black male. We have had benefits, if I can say that word, that are associated with being a black woman, but we still deal with stereotypes such as um, the assumption that all black women have attitudes. And if we speak up and share our opinion about something, we went off. And it's just, we, we constantly have to be self-aware. That's something that I would say that just uh, the body of Christ and people need to be Aware. Black people have to be self-aware because when we are ourselves, it can be perceived as being something that we're not. I appreciate these these insights, these thoughts. Thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Evans, yesterday when you and I were talking, you you uh, used an interesting phrase, and I've heard people use this before. You you said uh, every parent of an African American child has to sit down and have the talk. And for a lot of people, the talk uh, would probably cause them to assume what you're talking about is the birds and the bees talk. But the talk that you were referring to was relating to um, authorities if you get pulled over. So tell us about that. I'm, I'm going to ask a question in general about parenting, but specifically that particular parenting role. You, you have uh, two grown sons, is that right? Yeah. I do. A uh, 26 year old who will be. Uh, uh, living in Austin. Uh, he's okay. getting married at the end of the month. He's the uh, director of public policy for our convention now. And um, yeah, uh, when we talk about that, and, and again, I'm, I'm pretty sure Tim knows what we, what we mean when we have that talk. Absolutely. Uh, that, is, that is, you are, uh, you know, you're sat down at a given age, usually around nine or 10, and uh, you are uh, told how to quote unquote behave when you're stopped by the police. Uh, you know to put your hands on the steering wheel, you know uh, to uh, put your, uh, stick your hands out of the window, you know that if they ask you for your license and back in the day license and registration, you have to say, I am moving my right hand now at this time to get my wallet out of my pocket. So, it, you know, oh yeah, that's, um, it's just their way. I mean, the talk also includes uh, uh, when you go into uh, the grocery store or, or go into a department store, uh, you know that uh, you're probably going to be watched. Uh, well, you are being watched and uh, you knew not to put your hands in your pocket. You knew not to, uh, you know, uh, do a whole lot of things in regard to behave orally. And um, it's just the, the way it is. I mean, it's almost like Stockholm Syndrome. You just kind of know how to act you know, uh, when you are oppressed or you're with your oppressor to where it's, uh, it's almost, it becomes a norm, which is uh, shameful to say, but it is the case. And um, we also know, you know, um, again, I'm sure my brother Tim can help you to understand that, um, you know, if you've ever been around some of our African brothers or sisters, they, they, they speak with passion. I mean, I'm, I've been on the continent three, four times and heck, I thought they were arguing. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, brother, did I offend you? You know, but, 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 but we experienced some of the same things here in our country. I was in a meeting today with uh, two uh, this wrong, uh, young African-American men with the mayor and the police chief. And, and, and these guys, you know, we, we, we have a march tomorrow. And we just want to do some, some preliminary work before the march takes place, you're right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the chief was having a hard time because these guys had been harassed uh, since they were 14 years old. They're 30 years, 30, 31 years old now. And he couldn't understand, well, well where's his anger coming from? So I'm in the room saying, um, let me hit pause. Okay, uh, uh, you, 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 you bust it in their house. Uh, they drive down the streets, you stop them. Uh, you're asking them when they're at uh, the, the local pub if they have dope in the car, you don't ask anybody else. I, and I can go on, you know, but, um, these are the kinds of things that you just kind of get used to. I mean, myself, you know, I've been stopped, um, you know, while driving while black. And uh, 
and, and heck, I was a public official at the time, still am now. And, but, um, you know, so what, running for mayor, as a matter of fact, now. And, um, and some individuals said to me that uh, uh, I shouldn't, well, well, we shouldn't run our deacon uh, because then it will appear as if we're taking over. You know, and these are from other public officials in our city. So um, we're living this right now. This is an existential issue. And um, by the grace of God, maybe one day we're going we're gonna to get this worked out. I'd hope, though, that in the 90s we wouldn't have to have this conversation. Uh, but now here we are in 2020. How you doing, Doc? Here we are in 2020. And um, I'm in my mid-50s. And now I've got a grandkid, and we're still having these conversations. Michael, I appreciate you sharing that. Somebody else, did y'all have the talk or were you the recipients of the talk? I've given my first born son, who's 22, the talk. Um, when he was in his teens, he started hanging around with, you know, his little friends, started getting them into trouble, and I had to have the talk with him. Um, if your friends are a different race, the outcome of you know, what ends up happening to them versus what may possibly happen to you, you should expect that to be different. Um, and I always try to, I don't think that as Black people, we can forget that we're Black because if someone said we're constantly, you know, reminded of that. Um, but to, again, just go back to being uh, self-aware. So in having that talk with him, and I think through his own, like, personal experiences going honestly through the school of hard knocks. You see that unfortunately it's it's true. It's true. Yeah, having a daughter, I haven't necessarily had the son talk. Um, because again, black women and black men have different experiences. But I she I, Beth, I like when you use the word self aware when Kira started middle school, um, predominantly white school, Anderson High School, predominantly white high school. Um, I, as a, as a, a, just an adult, am aware of the differences between the demographics of the students there. And so I didn't necessarily have a race talk, um, specifically, but you kind of have the parent talk and the insinuation is there. Um, you're very, your teachers are very aware when there's trouble going on in the classroom, don't be that kid. So I didn't say, you know, if a white kid is acting up or a black kid is acting up, I was just more, don't be that kid, because I, we didn't really have to talk about race, but it is things, something that she was very aware of without me even having to say anything. And so I just didn't want her to be that kid. And that might not have been the best way to word it, um, but the message was still delivered and it was still received. Um, she was very self-aware on her own, um, which is kind of, and she wasn't really happy with me when she was going through the school, but my purpose for doing that was strategic because I know what the world is out there and there's some lessons that I as a parent can't teach her and there are things that she has to go through unfortunately she has to experience experience them on her own and so she was able on a certain level to see things um, I don't want to you know assume that AISD is a perfect you know uh, entity and things don't go wrong in the schools because we all know that they do. Um, so she was able to still see the type of things that I needed to prepare her for without me actually having to sit down and have a, a more specific talk because sometimes kids can learn by just listening and sometimes they have to learn by experiencing and she's one of those that has to learn by experiencing and so I let it get to a point where she, I knew when to step in um, when I felt like this has crossed the line that she can't handle and she shouldn't ha not have to handle. So we didn't have a specific talk about it, but it has happened over at least since sixth grade when it became very apparent that you are in a different situation and you need to be able, like um, Pastor said, know how to act in a certain situation because you are different, not necessarily because you're black, but ultimately it is because you're black in a white world. So. Tim, are you, um, you, I mean, you, you have sisters. Do you perceive that there is a kind of a different experience that they're having with culture than that you're having as a male? Yeah, I believe there's just an implied, like, uh, extra layer of aggression associated with men. And so I feel like 
you know, talks like the police talk are kind of more geared towards men because uh, police may feel, feel that they're more threatened, you know, in the presence of a male. It's because there's that applied aggression with men. One of the things, though, that uh, going back to Nicole, that uh, I know um, has been an issue I've, I've seen in interviews or read in articles is the, the whole question of, of um, perceived beauty, perceived attractiveness, right? The, the, uh, this may be changing with uh, a greater diversity of role models out there and a great, greater diversity of baby dolls out there and that kind of thing. But uh, Nicole, I would imagine, uh, of course, both you and Beth, uh, you know, being, going through adolescence, but then Nicole, your daughter going through adolescence, whole question of self-doubt and attractiveness and all of that, is it, do you perceive that it might be an extra wrinkle, an extra complication as an African American, um, I, I would ad adoles adolescent I adolescent girls, you know, of course, struggle with self image and self regard anyway, regardless of race. I, so I don't mean right. to say it's right. unique, but I wonder if there isn't an extra burden uh, in a predominantly white culture. I'm just going to ask uh, y'all. I would have to say more so in high school with Kira being at Anderson. Um, the choices that she had available to her may not have been as vast because the general population may not have been attracted to her or maybe felt like they could talk to her as, you know, I'm interested in you type of way because she's black. So the, those kids kind of were in their own little group. I believe at her freshman year, there were 2,300 about students there enrolled. And for the black population, it was somewhere close to 200 so there you know when you have that big of a, a jump between it's not equal um i don't know if they're if the the white students are allowed to date outside their race or you know i don't really know what their standard of beauty is versus what her standard of beauty is i have tried to instill in her it doesn't matter black white mexican puerto rican whatever if he makes you happy he makes you happy and I've kind of lived my way my life that way as well but I can't say coming from the other side if she was deemed less attractive because she was black um, I'd like to think you know even if they weren't attracted to her she was still a, a friend someone that they could talk to or joke with or whatever but the sense of beauty specifically you've got you know the Halle Berry's out there the Beyonce's out there but then you also have the the Viola Davis and the Oprah Winfrey's exactly. who are not traditionally beautiful women, but they are beautiful. Everyone is beautiful in their own way. So I don't know if there's, I know there is a standard of beauty out there, but I think that that has been slowly changing. You've got plus size models like Ashley Graham that is saying you don't have to be a size zero. So I think that in general is changing, but there's still the underlying because I'm a black woman, I might not be as beautiful as so and so. I don't want to put you know actresses' names out there, but you know I may not be considered beautiful because I don't look like this. I don't have blonde hair. I don't have blue eyes. I'm not a size zero. So we have. I think each culture has its own standard of beauty, and we have our own uh, people that we say are beautiful. Like I said, Halle Berry in the black community. I'm like that's at one point she was it. So it's like, oh, do I look like Halle Berry? Do I look like Janet Jackson? No, well, maybe I'm not that pretty, but it's like, yeah, you are. You, you're just, you're your own kind of beautiful. So I don't know if that answered the question. That one is a little bit more not, it's more gray than it is more about race because that's a girl issue. That's not just a, a, a black issue or a white issue. That's just a, being a woman. Yeah, I, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to clarify that too, that I think that, uh, self, you know, self-regard issues are, are, uh, really, really big and, and they're big with raising sons as well. People tend to minimize that, uh, boys and grown men never think about self-image issues. Uh, I can tell you we do, but, uh, the, uh, but I, but I, I think that it's almost, and, and, and some populations almost a crisis point, right? The, 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 uh, self-doubt and the wondering that uh, an adolescent female has. And you're right, it, it crosses uh, 
racial lines at that point. I just wondered if there wasn't an extra consideration there. Beth, were you going to jump in earlier on? Oh, yeah. So, like, growing up, I don't remember seeing, like, a lot of black models and things like that. So, there, for me, there was never a standard of beauty. It was just, you know, this is me. So, I never mm -hmm. really got into a mode of comparison, comparing myself to another race or even within, you know, the only, my own community. That was just something that didn't happen. And so, um, what I wanted to mention to Nicole is about her daughter. I think sometimes that black women, we can come across as very intimidating and we are, we are. Absolutely. So I think that your daughter probably had a lot of interest, but guys were probably afraid to not step up and try to talk to her. Uh, Absolutely. So That's I why I was like, it's not really a race thing with that. That's it's just not. It's, no, because yeah. I've been yeah. told that I men don't want to approach me because they think I'm always angry or I have this look on my face and it's in, they're intimidated. And so it's like, well, maybe we don't want to talk to her. But I'm like, please talk to me. Say hello. I, we might be friends now. You might be a new husband. I don't know. <laughs> well, you, you know, let, let me let me speak to that. I'm I grew up in a house full of women. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I want to I want to correct some of that. I think a lot of that, though, ladies, uh, uh, has has um, you know has, has a lot to say about you know the kind of 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 uh, impression uh, that um, you know a person uh, portrays onto other individuals. You, you know, uh, in in my family, uh, my mom and uh, my two sisters. I mean, they are. They, they, they are some, some tough ladies, you hear me? And uh, they are leaders. Uh, all three of them are leaders. And um, we always, in our family, we, we celebrated that. I mean, you know, uh, where somebody might call it bossy, I call it ambitious, you know, and, and those are positive traits, you know. Uh, uh, and again, it's, it would have a lot to do even with sometimes the way that I communicate. Some will say, you know, he's an angry guy. No, I'm as passionate as the white guy is. You know, when he raises his voice, he's passionate. I'm angry. No, I'm passionate. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that comes from my core. So, you, you know, I hear what you're saying, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying to God that that is something uh, in, in regard to uh, that child's demeanor uh, that, you are, that you are positively reinforcing because uh, that's just how you make it. You know, that's how you make it. You, I, I don't want a woman to dumb down. I mean, who are you? Let me celebrate you, queen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. Of course, been married 33 years. You know, so I've learned how to say yes, ma'am. You know, but still, you know, that, that stuff works. That works. Yeah. But I'd much rather you be ambitious and all of that stuff. And uh, I want to celebrate you. You know, I just, just need to throw that in there. And if, and if, a, guy, if a guy has an issue with that, it's, his problem is not hers. She mm. just got an insecure fella. You know, Absolutely. she needs to go get somebody else. You anyhow, amen. God bless. Absolutely. I've actually kind of been treat, preaching that because I'm, as the older I've gotten, gotten, the more confident I've gotten. And so if you can't handle my confidence and my, like you said, passion, then maybe you need to step to the side and let someone else or maybe work on it and then come back. So I'm trying to instill that with her because you know women raising a daughter not to downplay raising a son because I, I just didn't have a son but to raise a, a strong confident black woman it's a hard job to do and you have to you know make sure you reiterate over and over again you are beautiful you are worthy you are something special you do not have to stoop to other people's level level for people to like you be you don't be anybody else but I will add on to that. Perception is reality. Absolutely. I used to have people literally, I can't even remember how many times this has happened happening to me, happened to me in the past. I'm walking into a store and somebody would say, of just usually with somebody black, a black guy, why aren't you smiling? Why don't you smile? And I'm thinking, I don't feel like smiling. I'm not upset. Why are you talking to me? But what I, after it happened like so many times, uh, and then I had a, a pastor friend tell me, he was like, Jeff, you need to smile more. And then it hit me. I think God convicted me about it. And so I literally started practicing smiling because I found that it put more people at ease. 
it showed like what I was thinking about, you know, I'm, you know, everything is fine. You know, I'm not upset about or anything. So just, I, I, I see benefits in that for me in terms of adjusting myself. I'm still 100% best, but best practice is smiling now for her sake and for the sake of her fellow man to put them at ease. And I've just seen so many benefits from that. Again, it goes to being self-aware. It goes to me being black. And just being mindful of, of other people in that perception. Absolutely, Beth. I agree 100%. Now, um, four of y'all on the panel are uh, parents of African-American children. Three of you are parents of African-American sons. I'm including Mike McDonough on this uh, because of the gift that uh, Ben has been to, to their family. What are your hopes? What are your fears? when it comes to your children? <laughs> well, both of my boys are grown. Um, my hopes are that, um, you know, that there will really come a day, but I'm about to run out of time, but there will, there will come a day, I'm talking about lifetime, uh, where uh, I would, would be able to see uh, that, that they, are, they are really judged by who they are, how they act as opposed to, you know, my sister Beth just said, perceptions, you know, and, you know, because perception is a shade of prejudice. Uh, so I, I think that, I think that I, I would want for them to be judged by who they are, how they act, and by the way that they uh, contribute to society first. Thanks, somebody else. Well, for me, um, honestly, I don't think we'll see it on this side. I look at all the problems that the world faces, the problems with people, how we treat each other. We murder, we, you know, we kill the, you know, helpless fetuses. And, you know, even now with the, the horrible riots and things that are going on, man hasn't been able to solve, his, you know, his problems that he has created over the millennia that we've been here on the planet. And I believe that short of anybody coming to Jesus Christ and their heart changing. This is about a heart condition. I don't think that anybody will change. I don't think that we'll see that this side. And for me, I teach my children don't have unreasonable expectations on other people. You know, if you have a hard time controlling yourself, how can you expect for, you know, someone else to control themselves or you have control over them? So um, I try to teach them to be able to manage their expectations. But more than that, just fundamentally, give your life to the Lord pray, put everything in his hands. I see all these people on the news, they're literally like lying prostrate on the ground, their hands are in the air, they're kneeling, their heads are bowed. And I said, Father, if we took it to Second Chronicles 7, 14, and the church did that, and the church repented, we could see some change. The Lord would be able to heal the land, but it would have to start with the church. Outside of that, there won't be any change. That's what I teach my children. It has to start with us in the heart. Um, I think the fears are kind of self-evident, you know, with what we're seeing going on and stuff that's been, go been going on for a while. Um, that's kind of just self. I don't really have to say anything about that. But my hope is that if I've done my job as a parent, that going forward, my child will judge people not by what they look like, but by their character and by their content. And I know that's easier said than done because the first thing we see when we meet someone is what they look like. That's kind of your label. You're a black woman, you're a black man, you're a white woman, et cetera. Um, but that's the one to you identify them and then you get to know them. You learn about them. You take time to invest in them if they're worth investing in because not everyone is worth the time. Um, there are people that are here to do you harm and you just have to hopefully recognize that soon and don't, go that direction. So my hope is that she will continue to just judge people as they are, not for what, what they are, but for who they are, because that's really what we should be doing. And as Christians, we should be loving everyone and she be treating everyone with love and respect. And I know that's easier said than done. Um, but I think with what's been going on recently, we see that there hasn't been a lot of love initially but then people in their own way have been supporting each other and showing, you know, that just because we're different doesn't mean we can't get along. 
Um, will it last? I don't know um, until the next thing comes along. I hate to say that, but it's kind of been going on. There's been too many people that have been having incidents with police and, and such, and it should have stopped a long time ago. But will it stop? Probably not, but my, my hope is that we as people don't get discouraged because of a few bad apples in whatever the situation is, because not all people are bad. Every race has good people. Every race has bad people. And we just need to not focus on the bad and remember that God is in control and we need to be following what he's been teaching us and not what the world has been showing us. Yeah, let's, in fact, let's use that as a transition to the next question I wanted to ask, which was about the protests, the protests of, uh, uh, of recent days in different cities around the nation, including in Austin, in front of uh, police headquarters buildings. Um, and one of the things, by the way, if, if people aren't uh, really up on the protests, we do need to uh, be able to distinguish between those who have uh, attempted to peaceably assemble to express their grievances and uh, persons who have uh, maybe taken advantage of the situation for uh, creating chaos and destruction of property. In fact, I recently read of uh, one African-American group that was uh, planning to assemble on a Sunday night for, for a, a protest. It wasn't for George Floyd's death, but for a, another person whose name I've forgotten. And um, after they watched what happened on Friday and on Saturday, um, a particularly largely uh, young white sort of anarchists taking over the protest. They said, you know, we're, we're going to cancel our protest. This, this, this is, you know, going to reflect directly on what uh, we're trying to do on a bad light. So I think we need to uh, make sure everybody understands. I think there's a difference between a, um, you know, a, a what, what, the, what the Constitution uh, gives us the right to do, and that is to assemble, to express our grievances, and then, of course, the chaos and the anarchy and the destruction of property that I think those, those uh, things should not be regarded as hand in glove. They, uh, but, uh, Tim, you and I talked. Uh, you were at uh, the downtown protest at least one day, maybe two. Yep. Just fill us in on your what motivated you to join that and uh, – how you experienced that, whether you felt like it got the point across. I'm just going to turn it over to you. Tell us about your experience. Sure. So obviously protested, uh, protests had started in Minneapolis. And soon after that, you saw other big cities kind of having their own New York, LA. And so I just looked online to see if there was anything going on in Austin, because this was just something I felt really strongly about and really felt like I needed to make my voice heard just to be out there peaceful and just to, be a just to be a representative for the community. And so I was out there on Saturday. We started at APD around, I want to say noon it was. And at first, there was just a few hundred people there. Um, we we're just gathered outside of APD. Um, people were leading um, chants. People were all kind of in unison. And then from there, uh, people kind of went from uh, kind of the ground level on the street right outside of APD um, to I-35. And from there, people kind of started walking the highways. And from there, traffic was blocked for a little bit. But most people who were on the highway actually were pretty like receptive to it. They were honking their horns and they're very supportive. And so it was really cool to kind of see the community come together like that. I didn't see a lot of angry faces and people were kind of held back because of the protest. And then from there, that's when things kind of started uh, getting violent. Um, uh, at one point, I guess when law enforcement felt like they had to kind of take control of the situation, um, we were kind of all lined up and there was like a few cop cars in front of us. They were on the bridge trying to get onto the highway and we were all kind of lined up uh, blocking them from getting on the bridge. And so uh, the best, what they wanted to do to kind of clear us out the way, um, there was about eight to 10 policemen who just kind of started charging at us on horses. And so from there, I immediately got out the way because, I mean, I didn't assume the horses cared about my well-being. I could see myself, you know, getting trampled or you know, something like that. So I got out of the way. But some people kind of just stood back and people were like knocked over on horses. Um, people were just kind of getting knocked over and kind of hurt. And then from there, 
as police kind of started taking control of the situation on the interstate. Um, that's when the rubber bullets started coming out. Um, that's when things just started getting more violent. And so things kind of, things took a turn for the worse once the law enforcement felt like they had to take control of the situation and they started doing it with, I thought, just unnecessary force, knocking people over. And you've heard more stories even since then. Uh, there was a young gentleman I just heard of who was a student at Texas State, 20 years old, and this one hurt me deep. But his, I, I believe it was his skull that was fractured with one of those um, rubber bullets that they're using that they say have has less lethal force. And so, I mean, the the violence and some of the uh, things that the people who are out there protest who are out there protesting have taken from the police. I, mean, I, I don't think it's something to be overlooked. And so. It's kind of been my experience with the protests. Hmm. You feel that, um, do, you, do you feel that you were heard? I mean, you, the collectively, the, the group mm -hmm. was heard. I've, I've read a few things from Chief Manley um, that makes me think that, uh, that this, at least at the administrative level, is taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. So I've been kind of in and out of trying to keep up with things, trying to keep a balance of staying informed and keeping up with my mental well-being. And so I know uh, Mayor Adler has made some comments and he's spoken up. And so I imagine from there, I mean, the city is definitely going to have to respond. I guess we'll just have to see what the response is. And it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a lot of collaboration with the community, I believe, for something, you know, for something just to come out of this. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think is next, Tim, <clears throat> as far as um, protests or, I mean, what, as you've been trying to keep up with this, do you, do you think there's another weekend of protest? Do you think that uh, we move it to, uh, that, that we will see it move to um, online petitions that people are encouraged to sign? What, what do you think is next with all of this? I believe people are still going to be protesting. I want to say I saw something from the Austin Justice Coalition that they had planned protests this upcoming Sunday. And so people are still going to be out there. Down was advertised as a peaceful protest. They're definitely taking into account what's happened up to now. And so, but I believe people will still be protesting, but um, there will come a time where we're going to have to kind of take a shift and make it very action oriented. Protest is action, right? It's spreading awareness. It's making yourself heard. But in terms of legislation, actually working with, uh, Austin as a city from an administrative standpoint. And that's getting, you know, plugged in with these different community groups who are trying to collaborate with these types of entities. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Evans, you had said that uh, there's going to be uh, a march or a protest uh, in the Mansfield area tomorrow. Is that right? Yes, sir. About, uh, we're expecting about 300 or so, if not more which will be the largest protest we've had in town since uh, the attempt to integrate the schools in uh, 1956. Wow. So um, there are a lot of nervous people, and um, rightfully so. Uh, we are uh, asking uh, people to come together, pray with us, and because uh, we're going to be there. It's a student march, and we appreciate the fact that students wanted to do it, uh, the adults said, we're not going to allow our kids to march uh, without being their monitors, without being their guides. So um, that's kind of where we are. And um, I'm pretty sure I'll be up all night just thinking about 12 or 13 different scenarios as to what could possibly happen. But uh, I, I pray, Tom, that next time we talk that I'm able to uh, give you a shout of hallelujah because uh, there's a, a big part of me that believes that we're going to be all right. So uh, we, we've been planning that all day today, all day, beginning at 7.30 a.m. Uh, on and off and uh, thinking that we've identified who some of the possible, you know, uh, bad actors might be. And, and I don't mean people you know, protesting. I mean, uh, persons who they thought was, uh, would be suspected of vandalism, but uh, God is good. Uh, we sat down with those individuals. Uh, we, we hugged and shook hands and uh, 
some common ground. So, um, you know, I, and I'm serious. I, I hope uh, when Saturday comes, I'm able to tell you, brother, I slept real well last night because of this. <laughs> so that, that's where we are. That's where we are. We'll, uh, we'll be praying with you to that end. Uh, uh, those who are um, watching this uh, Zoom panel discussion, uh, we, this actually uh, was uh, filmed on Thursday night, and uh, we intend to release it at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. So most people who will be watching this will be uh, watching this a couple of days after we filmed this, but uh, we'll be in, in prayer with you guys to that end. Let me ask a question regarding uh, protests. Uh, how do we, or, or maybe even the question, even the prior question is, should uh, protests um, try to uh, join together um, the expression of frustrations about abuses of authority and at the same time express uh, support for law enforcement, support for efforts in law enforcement uh, to, you know, to fix these, these problems themselves. So I, I said it may be a more fundamental question to ask is, should even those things be joined? I mean, maybe a protest, uh, there's all kinds of other things that can be said at another time, but the point of this protest is to express frustration about abuses of authority and abuses of power. But I just, I know that um, there, there have got to be a number of persons and law enforcement from all races who are wearing the uniform that might wonder, uh, well, well, where you know, are my efforts being recognized at being a good cop or my efforts at, at being a, a servant to the community being even noticed in these protests? And so I just want to ask the question, should um, protests be able to sort of join together that, you know, general respect for authority and frustration at abuses of authority uh, and if so, how? And, and I guess, of course, any of us can answer this question, but I was asking specifically to uh, Tim and to Michael uh, regarding protests that uh, have happened or protests that are coming up, maybe specifically you guys. Well, you know, I, I, I would think that, and I know this to be true, uh, the, the protest is just the first stage in many stages. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have the protest, people protest to be heard. That's important. But, but, but the dialogue must take place after the protest. Absolutely. You see, uh, once we've gotten your attention, now let's sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. And now, let's not just dialogue. I mean, let's not just kumbaya. But let's 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 uh, have a, something real, some empirical evidence, something something tangible to happen to take place. Policy change, change in the city ordinance, a change in the law. Let let's let's see something happen after this. If not, it's a vicious cycle, and we just will prepare for this to cycle up again when something else happens. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. I'll hush. Um, no, I, I was no, I was liking what you were saying. I appreciated it, Michael. Tim, your thoughts on uh, what you, you know, what what role you feel these, uh, or what message these protests uh, need to send in terms of you know support for uh, law enforcement in general, or do you think? And I think Dr. Evans has got a point that mm -hmm. the point of protest is this, and then after we get a chance to say. A broader message, but right now, what we're narrowly and specifically focusing on is frustration. I agree. I agree. It's going to have to fall uh, that type of timeline, and whenever it is time for dialogue, uh, it really has to come from a place of like sympathy and understanding. If you want to get anything done, and it will have it will have to be collaborative. The community absolutely needs to be involved, and their their needs need have to be heard. So real change can actually happen, and so. The specifics of that, um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of community leaders emerging and trying to get the ears of, you know, Mayor Adler and some of these other leaders that we have in Austin, not even just in Austin, but throughout Texas and throughout the country. But yeah, there will have to be a shift to, you know, making this kind of a dialogue and 
it has to come from a place of empathy, from my opinion. So let me ask, um, uh, and I, I'm thinking that Dr. Evans will want to chime in on this next question I want to ask, but uh, all of us uh, on the panel um, can can respond to this as well. But um, you know, the the question about um, protests and speaking publicly leads to the question about what uh, role the churches or Christian groups, Christian communities specifically, should have for this. Dr. Evans, I'm sure you've you've heard that issue before that, hey, you know, talking about justice issues, talking about public policy issues is a distraction. The church ought to be focused on evangelism and discipleship, and uh, we're, we're going to get sidetracked if we're talking about justice issues. Now, you you and I, you know, we, we've talked. We know that that's not the way we ought to be looking at it, but t you t uh, tell us, tell us why that's the case. Why is justice, why are justice issues an aspect of discipleship? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think, I think, uh, uh, Brother Goodman, if, 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 and there are a whole lot of people, you're all right, that, that have that particular view and that viewpoint, uh, they're missing about two thirds of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when they take on uh, that kind of mindset, and especially from my tradition, the African American tradition, and the place, the role that the church has had. Uh, in, in civil rights, not just for uh, African Americans, but uh, also for women's suffrage, also uh, for, uh, if you would, the, the uh, a migrant community and all of that. All of that grew up out of uh, the, uh, the the African American church in particular. That is that is a fact. Look, now you're hearing my passionate side. You know that 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 is a a fact. Uh, with, so, so then when we talk about justice, uh, you know, we, we, we have had to, to live that. Uh, when we talk about the exodus, you know, uh, our African, uh, American, uh, four parents, uh, you know, they, we live the exodus, you know, we're talking about crossing the river Jordan, it was the Ohio river, you understand? So, so for us, as it concerns the word of God, it is, it is literal. Uh, for uh, many of the people I preach to, and these are, uh, are, are highly educated individuals, you know, one end of the spectrum, then the other end of the spectrum, you know, may, may be a person uh, who's doing agricultural work. So, uh, yeah, it's it, 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 it intertwined, I believe, in the life of the church. And even now, as uh, we are feeding people, our churches are people who are laid off or have gone through the, the furloughed, you know, uh, the church has been turned inside out. And I think now you see more of the expression of the body of Christ more now than you have in the past 100 years. So um, that's where I come down on it. I think it's who we are. We are the presence of Christ to the world. We are ambassadors for Christ to the world. And I'd rather see that sermon than to hear it and not see it practiced. And that's a whole cliche, but it's true any day. I appreciate that, Michael. Thank you. Somebody else on the whole question of um, talking about justice issues and public policy, is it a distraction from evangelism and discipleship? Couldn't have said any better than Michael. <laughs> yeah, he, that was a good, a good job there, Pastor Evans. Well, I appreciate this, y'all, Beth and Nicole, and Tim, and uh, Dr. Evans. Thank you so much for this hour of time together, and I hope it will be um, uh, heard by uh, a lot of people at Hillcrest and beyond who will be able to uh, uh, think about these things in terms of how they're uh, uh, being processed by our own members uh, and also by uh, how it's uh, impacting folks in our community that uh, we are responsible to bear witness to. I know that uh, folks at Hillcrest have often heard me uh, say it, but um, if we are reading the Bible and teaching the Bible and practicing the Bible in a consistent way, um, there are going to be those times where we will cause our conservative friends to think we're too progressive 
And there'll be those times when we're gonna cause our progressive friends to think we're too conservative, but we're not trying to be conservative or trying to be progressive. We're just trying to be biblical and that's gonna cause us to sort of bump up against areas uh, which uh, each side feels uncomfortable about. So as a general rule, it's not a true across the board, but as a general rule, um, those who are more progressive are uh, typically uh, very passionate about uh, issues of race and economic inequality and sometimes a little uncomfortable about issues of life and, um, and sexuality. And on the other side, conservatives tend to be very outspoken about issues of life and sexuality and are uncomfortable when the subject turns to race and economic inequality. But again, if we're, if we're speaking the Bible consistently, studying the Bible consistently, and trying to practice it consistently, we're going to find ourselves that to, to understand really what it means in 1 Peter when it says that we are aliens and strangers in our own land. And the reality is that if we are conservatives and with our conservative friends and never feel like aliens and strangers, or if we kind of tend toward more progressive things and we're always with our progressive friends and we never feel like aliens and strangers, then it may be that it's, it's not the Bible that's influencing our lives more so than our favorite radio personality or podcast personality or something like that. We, we need to make sure it's the word of God and the spirit of God who uh, that is being uh, the main influence is, uh, and, and shaping our idea of the way life ought to be lived and the way we ought to be thinking about things. Um, as we get ready to go, there's just a couple of uh, practical things I want to encourage everybody to do out there who's listening to, uh, to this interview. One is, I found out about this yesterday, the uh, excellent movie, uh, Just Mercy, um, I read the book and then I saw the movie. I recommend them both. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the movie Just Mercy is available to stream for free on most streaming platforms in the month of June. And so uh, if you haven't had a chance to see the movie yet, go on Hulu, go on Amazon Prime, go on your favorite streaming platform and see if it's available. And I recommend that uh, you watch that. And then the other thing that I recommend, make this a summer reading project. Um, people at our church always knows eventually I'm going to get around to mentioning Tim Keller. But uh, Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice, is a superb book about how speaking about justice and uh, calling for justice is a kind of a form of pre-evangelism, you know, in our world. And it is a form of, of active discipleship in our world. And of course, Tim Keller is so good at not only speaking to Christians, but speaking to skeptics. And so I would say, those of us who are believers, we ought to read this book, Generous Justice, so we can be better at understanding how to do justice ourselves, but also so that we can be do better at communicating to um, uh, people uh, that we're trying to bear witness to who, who may think that uh, Christianity has absolutely nothing to say about justice issues. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot that Christianity can and should say about justice issues if you'll read this book. Well, once again, uh, everybody, thank you so much for being a part of this. Like I said at the beginning, it's what we do as a church is to put panels together and try to uh, talk more deeply about how this is impacting people in our own church and our community. And um, as Tim and Michael specifically mentioned about continued protests or organized protests uh, coming up, we will be in prayer about these things, y'all. And uh, Michael, uh, Dr. Evans, as you said, uh, get back with me, please, and let me know how things went in Mansfield after this Sunday rally. Everybody, God bless you. Thank you. And um, everybody stay healthy and safe out there.